They were hosted by my girl from Philly, Eve. Oh. You know, you remember Eve, right? Rapper? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the old school. Oh my God. <laughs> well, she was on Wendy Williams the other day. What? And she says, ah, stop. She said she doesn't really remember dating Stevie J. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't mind that. I don't mind that. You know, I showed, you believe I showed her how to be a woman, you know what I'm saying? I, I raised her. Oh, my God. Can, can you say more about that, sir? Oh, my yeah, God. You know, we dated for a while. You know, when, when I met her, she came into my living room with cut off jean shorts and Timberlands. I turned into a Chanel Fendi Prada Louis girl. Wow. But I love her. That's my baby. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if it's mutual, dog. All right, but, but we're going to move on because there's one more thing I got to talk you, about. Oh, I bought those gray minks she had on right oh. there. <laughs> I wouldn't be claiming that if I was you right now, dog. I don't know. I don't know why the not. mix wasn't so fresh. Thanks, everybody. Mark, Mark and I go back. Way back. Hey, everybody. How y'all doing? Mark, thanks for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Massive, uh, massive year for you. Congratulations. Yeah, everything sort of really went in a great direction after I quit HuffPost. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Shade thrown. There's, there's a future when you leave. No. Um, <laughs> No, everything was, <laughs> it's well, been Mark, a great you, year. I've been really you lucky. You just bought Yahoo, so I mean, yeah. you really made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's um, been great. Everything's been awesome so this year. I've been really lucky. I want to just talk about that clip that we just saw, because in that clip, you're talking to two reality show stars, essentially, which yeah. in, in, in a lot of circles, I would say uh, uh, reality show stars are derided and, and, and sort of excluded from any sort of intellectual conversation regarding pop culture or any sort of, sort of uh, pedigree conversation in general. Yeah. But you're having a somewhat intellectual conversation with them, or at least around them, clearly trying to sort of bridge this pop culture gap, which I think for so many audiences has already been bridged, but media outlets sort of lag. Yeah, we absolutely direction. lag. No, we absolutely lag. I, I think we're still in this sort of high-minded uh, ideology we're, we're, we're invested in it that suggests that reality stars aren't real stars and that that's a cheap form of pop culture and we can do better than that. And I think that there's a level of elitism attached to that that I think ignores the fact that everyday people want to watch this stuff and they're invested in these characters and they're invested in these ideas. And it's not that people don't, it's like in the 80s when people watch pro wrestling. People say, oh, these idiots in the South, they don't know it's fake. It's not that people didn't know pro wrestling was fake. They were able to hold at arm's length um, their skepticism. They were able to sort of um, suspend their disbelief to enjoy what's going on. Uh, all projects are scripted, all projects are coordinated, all projects are heavily produced, even the, the live and the real stuff. Uh, with reality TV, I think it's the same thing. I think these are real people with real lives and real stories. And when you meet them, you realize how real it is and how real they are. But at the same time, there's a story underneath it that we can get at. And I think my show gives us an opportunity to do that. Let me be very clear though, VH1 Live is not a reality show infomercial. We have other guests. Last night, for example, we had Notori Norton from Power on. Uh, if you all saw it, and we talked about all kinds of things. We talked about Melania Trump, we talked about uh, Hillary Clinton, we talked about the WNBA protests. I mean, the show is moving in a lot of directions. Um, but we do love reality TV, and we don't pretend not to. And so for me, the show is an opportunity to unpack some of that stuff and talk about some of that stuff. And the truth is, the numbers are great, right? And I'm not talking about my numbers, um, but the reality show numbers, you look across the board, whether it's Housewives, whether it's uh, the VH1 franchises like uh, Love Not just the ratings numbers, but the model itself. Yeah. The numbers are incredible yeah. as well. Exactly. Yeah. Studios are doing it partly because it's cheap to, cheap to, cheaper to exactly. produce, but, but also because people want to watch it. I mean, on a house, Atlanta, the Love and Hip Hop uh, Atlanta finale is on uh, next Sunday, and there will be millions and millions, there will be three or four million people watching that. Juxtapose that to who watches CNN. Or juxtapose that to even who watched the finale of Mad Men. Right. Like, exactly. I, I, and I love Mad Men, sorry, but like, it, it's one of those things that there is a, a certain amount of elitism in pop culture where, and a lot of times I think it falls along, uh, uh, unfortunately I would say along black and white lines as well, where Absolutely. I think there's white people who are sort of at the top of writing criticism for the most part of pop culture are constantly, whether they mean to or not, putting, you know, quote, their shows or shows that sort of represent white people sort of at the top of the critical consensus. No, I think you're absolutely right. We all, in, in the academy, we often talk about how black people get positioned versus white people. And we often say white people bring theory and black people bring experience. The same thing happens in pop culture, right? Black people bring the stories, white people criticize, critique, analyze, produce, own, direct <laughs> those stories as well. And so this kind of hierarchy is troublesome. And we want to- Steal. Steal, steal. That's the, yeah, let's be honest, right? Melania, they just straight Melania it. And, and we want to be able to change that, you know? And part of what I think 
I'm trying to do as a critic, but also as a host of VH1 Live and other projects, is help think through some of that stuff and complicate the way we understand pop culture. And again, these people have stories. I mean, if you actually watch uh, reality television, at least VH1 reality television, I mean, you, if you all watch Love and Hip Hop, you see people who are talking about social dislocation, parentlessness, they're talking about uh, economic deprivation, they're talking about addiction, they're talking about parenting, they're talking about love, they're talking about mass incarceration. Look at Scrap, you know what I mean? Go, going to jail for f 20 years, five of which will be in, under confinement for a marijuana sentence at the same time that we see what's going on in Colorado. I mean, these are conversations that we're able to actively have and what I'm trying to do is push what's happening on, on at, at nine o'clock into an even more interesting conversation at 10 o'clock and I think we can do that. Have you run up, I mean, obviously you, you wouldn't be able to say whether you have, but I mean, that is pushing a sort of political uh, point of view uh, while having these conversations, I could, would imagine, could run up uh, against some hurdles. It, it could, but honestly, VH1's been great about that so far. At no point have I been told, don't do this, you can't do this, don't touch that. I think if anything... And honestly, I, we're in the middle of an election season, so like, yes, touch the election exactly. as much as you can. Because remember, VH1 is about pop culture. Donald Trump isn't just a political figure. He's a piece of pop culture, right? I thought you were going somewhere. Right? I know. He's a piece of, <laughs> he's a piece of many things, but he's a, piece of, he's a piece of pop culture. And there's no way to watch what happened at that convention last week, whether it's Ted Cruz grandstanding or whether it's Melania Trump straight just jacking, you know, uh, uh, Michelle Obama's, Michelle Obama's speech. speech and the memes that came out of it, right, which was another testimony to black genius. When you look at the memes that came out, the jokes that came out the next two days, that was better than the speech itself. When you look at all of that, what you see is pop culture, so they, they want me to go there. Last night, N Natori Naughton from Power was on, and she was talking about, um, I was teasing her about all the sex that was on her show, and she said, yeah, but what's interesting is, I don't have more sex on my show than a whole bunch of shows that on, cable, on cable TV, right? It's no more hypersexual, and it's certainly not more, a it's certainly not gratuitous, and certainly not, you know, sort of more vulgar in, in a traditional sense than other shows, but there's something about black people and working class black people on TV having sex that gets understood by the public in, in a different way than what would happen on another show. And I hadn't thought about is it Is that true? I mean, that, I don't know if it's true or not. Yeah, I, my point is though, it, it was a space to have that conversation. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. that's, that's an interesting theory, but I think when gratuitousness happens in Game of Thrones, which is ostensibly a, 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 a majority white show, right. That gets very much criticized and talked about in regards to the sex scenes, lampooned, as well as, yeah, heavily criticized. And I think any girls as well. No, I, I agree. Yeah. I, you're the pop culture expert. You know, I don't watch those things. Um, but, <laughs> however. Mark is the biggest girls fan. <laughs> <laughs> He's not lying. Um, but, but my point is, on a sh on, you asked about whether we could go in certain directions. To have a pop culture show where she was talking about race, sexuality, I mean, that's the point, so we could have that conversation, even if she's wrong. We could still have that conversation, and VH1 has never said no, so I feel, that's why I'm so excited about the show. It's because I have an opportunity to go in any direction I want every single week. As long as you start with, or with a reality star there. <laughs> well, you know, well that's the thing, every week we won't. Oh, okay. Every week we won't, and again, this week, sometimes it just makes sense, I mean, um, and let's be honest, I mean, when you start a new show, you want to bridge as much of your previous audience as you can. Well, absolutely, yeah. and I, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to to make fun of that or anything yeah. because it's actually really smart. It's a good way to bring an audience into a bigger conversation. Right, exactly. But I mean, look at Andy Cohen. I mean, every every Sunday he had Housewives on until he didn't anymore, right? And, yeah. and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, he had Anderson Cooper one day. He had so and so one day. And what we're trying to do is is kind of tighten that curve a little bit, um, or shorten it rather, so that. We don't have to wait two years to do that. I'm coming out of the gate with, hey, every week we'll have also we'll talk about some of the stuff that happened on the shows, and sometimes you'll have reality stars, but we'll also have people from all over the world. I have guests scheduled over the next few months that are from everywhere, from pop culture to politics to sports. We got a lot of great people. You got coming. Debbie Wasserman Schultz coming on. Yeah, yeah. Apparent her schedule just opened up, so <laughs> <laughs> she's she's really free all of a sudden. So um, yeah, I got her. What can we? Can we talk a little bit about just this, uh, this election right now? Because you're a really smart guy, and I feel like you have a pretty nuanced take on everything that's going on. Um, so just the rundown. How are you feeling about the DNC? How are you feeling about Hillary? I mean, I am, I'm, I'm pretty far to the left, personally, yeah. I think, in my politics. And, and I, as much as I support Hillary, I probably would have fallen on my sword for Bernie Sanders for a little while. And at this point, I, I feel as though I have to support Hillary in order to... Battle Protect the union and save democracy. 
Yeah. Right. You know, there are these metal dramatic headlines like the Washington Post says, democracy's at stake. And obviously, her post for a long time has also had a very strident position on, on Donald Trump, as have other outlets. Well, I will say this. If Russia is hacking for the purpose of uh, helping Donald Trump in the election, democracy might actually be at stake. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. But, I mean, you could make that argument eight years ago when the Taliban said they prefer to have President Obama. Right? Oh, right. So, I mean, this could be some... There's all kinds of levels to this. What I would argue, and I, what I would argue ultimately, though, is that no one should feel compelled to vote for anyone out of fear. I don't think we should vote our fears. I think we should vote our hopes. Now, you're talking to somebody who is not just a member, but a, an active a surrogate for Jill Stein in the Green Party. So, um, I'm, I've clearly decided I, I don't feel I don't feel the need to take that position. What do you, how do you uh, how do you respond when people say, "Don't you feel like that's dangerous? Isn't it dangerous to sort of vote for a candidate who could push votes away from the Democrat the Democratic candidate who's battling against Donald Trump, which many people have reser have used words as a demagogue for?" And yeah, I mean, I understand the argument. I mean, the truth is, you can't you can only vote for one person, right? So every time you vote for somebody, you're taking votes away from someone else. Um, this idea that Hillary is our default because we can all agree that Donald is the worst of two evils and, and the kind of thing we want to avoid at all costs. Which is the thing that we've said every election. And, and I, tr I trouble that very idea. Th that's my point. I, I don't buy that uh, for multiple reasons. In 2000, Gore was the worst of, uh, of the two evils. Right. You know, in, in or the better of two evils. The better of two evils, yeah. excuse me. And I think in 2008, I think even people called Obama the better of two evils because right. he fell on a sort of, as much as his, uh, you know, he spoke from a, a leftist point of view, his politics in many ways were sort of centrist. Yeah, at, at, at best. <laughs> at, he's like a, yeah, yeah. So that's a whole other conversation. But I, 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 would, I would say... Um, I don't concede that the differences between Hillary and Trump are so vast that we have to make a we have to make a pragmatic choice at the expense of our own ide ideologies. I would also say that if 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 take take the exact statement, take the exact position you take right now, which is that you're going to hold your nose and go in the polls and probably vote Hillary because you feel like you have to, right? Because you don't want Donald Trump. Is there anything Hillary could say or believe? that would make her a non-negotiable, that would be a non-negotiable and would make her candidacy an impossibility for you. For example, if she were, anti, if she were an explicit anti-Semite, if, if she believed the blacks should still be enslaved, if she supported, you know what I mean? If, if she believed any of those things, with the exact same politics, exact same layout, at some point you might say, because I don't want to put you on the spot, at some point you might say, okay, as much as I like this, this is a moral non-negotiable for me, right? I mean, we probably all say there are certain things that are non-negotiable, whether it's reproductive rights, whether it's rape culture, whether it's whatever the thing might be. Weird, you haven't named my non-negotiable yet. <laughs> <laughs> these damn sugar bands on soda in movie theaters, yeah. I, I, <laughs> that's it. That's actually most likely for Ricky. If you knew Ricky, you'd know that's most likely. I guess my point Love is... my soda. Love right, my soda. <laughs> as someone, first of all, as someone who, who fiercely advocates... Uh, against the occupation of Palestine, I find her stance to be a non-negotiable. Uh, as someone who is frustrated with the constant, constant um, cozying up to Wall Street, I find her stance uh, on the economy and on free market fundamentalism a non-negotiable. Well, Tim Kaine was just out stumping for uh, deregulating the big exactly. banks once again before he was picked uh, as the VP. Right, like last week he was exactly uh, uh, worshiping at the altar of the free market, and now suddenly he's saying, eh, maybe I was wrong for now, right, <laughs> um, until next week. And so I guess for me, there are non-negotiables that are on the table. That's the, other, the other thing is, at some point we need an option that isn't just the lesser of two evils. We need to actually develop a freedom dream and articulate a political movement and moment that we want to see come into fruition. That can't happen if we constantly stay right in this place of Hillary versus Trump or McCain versus Obama or McCain or you know or Kerry versus Bush or Bush versus Gore or whatever. We can't if we stay in that place, then we never get where we need to be. I would rather sacrifice four years of Donald Trump to build even after the eight years that we had with Bush. Yeah, but I found that one thing that happened under Bush, well, it's, it's an interesting point, but one thing that happened under Bush was there was a lot more mobilization. You saw, I saw far more anti-war activism. I saw far more anti-capitalist, uh, anti, anti, uh, anti unregulated capitalist action in, in 2000, 2008 than I've seen from 2008 to 2016. I watched black people for the last eight years support the Bush doctrine, essentially, right? I mean, they were calling for preemptive strikes in Syria when Obama was. And when have black people in the history of America ever done that? I mean, there's this way in which the Obama administration in some ways has silenced us to these things. So I would say that, but also I would argue that the Bush moment 
would, was not nearly as extreme as the Trump moment would be. Not, not necessarily in terms of policy, but even in terms of the national discourse. I think the country's in a place where they will be ready to react. They'd be ready to press. Um, and I'd, I'd like to see that happen. Now, the, the, the two arguments that I find compelling, um, not persuasive, but compelling, um, is one, uh, that's easy for you to say in a place of privilege, Mark. Right? Like, if Trump is president. If Trump's uh, president, you're still going to have a job. You're still going to be. You're sh still shit be might get better for me, right? I mean, tax wise. I mean, you, and Ricky makes way more than I do. Like, Fucking bullshit. The, the Bush tax cuts <laughs> help Ricky. You know what I mean? Like, like we, we would all, you know, so people say it's selfish of you. The people who are on the bottom are going to catch the most hell. Yeah. It's a fair point. Um, but I would argue that people on the bottom have caught, continue to catch hell under Obama. Right? When you look at the economy, you look at who's not only unemployed but not even looking for work anymore. When you look at the way in which the uh, minimum wage has not gone up, when you look at jobs being exported, when you look at the decimation of unions, and I don't see anything in the next eight years under Hillary Clinton that would make me feel any better about that. And so, yes, might there be a slight hit backwards, but I think what we could gain from a legitimate left-wing movement in this country far exceeds that. We have, that's why I say we have to vote our, our hopes and not our fears. Now, the Supreme Court argument is a much more persuasive argument to me. Right, like, you you might have five, you know what I mean? Anything can happen. Who saw, who saw Scalia leaving right now, right? Yeah. I mean, like, that can always happen. Yeah. And again, I would love to have the Supreme Court on my side as I'm fighting to move the country to the left. But I think at some point, we have to build an actual movement. And so for me, that you means- You have Chris Christie as a, as a Supreme Court judge. Oh my God, can you imagine? That's like a legitimate possibility under a Trump. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's a legitimate possibility because I mean, Trump's nominees, and uh, with the exception of Mike Pence, the people that he has surrounded himself have just been other pop culture scandals. It yes, that's if you're very a, true. It doesn't matter if you're a political figure. It's like, do you have? Can you get press right. in pop culture? You can be a part of my administration. It, the exception it, of Mike Pence. It does kind of seem that way, and I, I, I'd like to think that Republicans are more responsible than that. I mean, we saw under. I, w I know, I know. Nobody but just saw my eyes widen when he. Al Elena Kagan, though. I mean, when you when you look at, for example, dangerous thing coming out of that this last RNC. I, that's very true. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. But the good thing is Republicans hate Donald Trump too, so that's why I think we got a shot. You know what I mean? And he, and they even resent it when George Bush tried to make his lawyer a Supreme Court uh, justice. You know, ten years ago, they were like, Nah, dog. Like, we ride with you on a lot of things, man. But like, we got to draw a line somewhere, and they drew the line there. So I feel comfortable. Uh, that that won't happen. But no, it, it's a very scary thing to imagine a Trump presidency. That, that's why I'm fighting and writing and doing everything I can to help resist that. Well, uh, I want to bring up I want to bring up your book, which I have right here. Wow. Luckily, that's an amazing segue. I said writing. Well, you picked up a book. Well, this, this guy's segue, a fucking pro. The segue wasn't writing, but thank you. Uh, the segue was when you were talking about how poor people are going to catch hell. Ah, but yes. be it in a Republican administration or a Democratic administration. Your yeah. book is called Nobody, Casualties of America's War on the Vulnerable from Ferguson to Flint and Beyond. Right. And I think what your book is really about, be the people white or black, is the war on the poor and on the, vul on the most vulnerable in this country. Absolutely. And I think what you say about Flint in this book is the most powerful because Flint is still the most under-talked about issue in our country right now. And it was, I mean, it, 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 numerically it wasn't genocidal, but it was almost like, uh, it was almost yeah. a genocide. Right, and, and the, the jury is still out, right, on, on what exactly happened. And when you add Cleveland to the mix and Philadelphia to the mix and other cities where they are literally poisoning the water, you see what I call in the book the most profound act of civic evil of this young century. Uh, we, the book is about state violence on some level. Um, and I look at these cases in Cleveland with Tamir Rice or, or Hempstead with Sandra Bland, which is more complicated, obviously, Ferguson with Mike Brown. And, uh, we go down the list, you know, Walter Scott in Charleston. And then we get to Flint. And for some, it might be a jarring move in the book. And when I wrote the book, when, when I was writing the book, I, I didn't have, Flint hadn't happened yet, or it wasn't, certainly wasn't something I was thinking about. I, I, went, I went to write a book about Ferguson, and I went to tell a story about Ferguson, because my point was, when Mike Brown got killed in Canfield, and he lay there for four hours, like he belonged to nobody. It was an awful moment. It, it was a 21st century lynching of sorts, you guys. Kids standing around watching it. 
He's laying there dead, sheet not covering his head, no medical establishment coming to get him. They finally put a blanket over him. It doesn't cover his body. Blood is trickling through the cracks. You can smell death in the air. Buzzards are flying around, or flies and birds are flying around. There's a weird vibe in the air, and it's not just the local lynching anymore. Now it's mediated throughout global, the global universe, right? So now we're on Twitter talking about it. We come into HuffPost the next day, we're talking about it. This kid killed, lay there for four hours, right? There's this thing going on. But the story of Ferguson, to me, wasn't just a story about Mike Brown getting killed by Darren Wilson, because that happens a lot. What was fascinating to me was the fact that long before he died at the hands of Darren Wilson, there was this way in which the Normandy School District rendered him nobody. Broken schools. We have first class jails and second class schools in this country. He was part of a public housing industry that essentially failed the poor. A liberal experiment, as I talk about in the book, right? A liberal experiment at housing to create social justice through housing. It failed. So you got public housing failing him, public education failing him, the welfare system failing him, the job market failing him. Nobodyness isn't just about being killed by police officers' bullets, although it is that. It's about all those other things. So by the time we get to Flint, if you were to take, and I say this in the book, if you were to take everybody from Flint in Charleston, in the Eric Garners of New York, in the Sandra Blands of Hempstead, in the Tamir Rice's of Cleveland, if you were to go to the uh, Renisha McBride's of Detroit, if you were to go down to Florida and grab Jordan Day, if you were to put them all, Trayvon, if you were to take them all and put them in a city, throw in Freddie Gray in Baltimore, that city might look like Flint. People who, even if they don't get killed by state violence through the form of bullets, they're still committed to what Mumia used to call, call slow death row, the death of poverty the death of systemic disinvestment, the, 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 the idea that some of our lives are simply worth more than others and it ain't us. The idea of the political arrangement being such that some folk have access to social goods and resources, others don't, yet they got the same vote. The idea that some people have access to jobs, other people don't, even though they got the same resume. The idea that some people get reasonable doubt, other people get reasonable suspicion. All of this is part of how we make sense of the world. All of that is this idea of nobody is, and you go to Flint and you have a system that fails everybody. You talk about collective punishment, we could talk about collective punishment in Gaza, we could talk about collective punishment in the West Bank, we could talk about collective punishment in Flint for the crime of what? Being poor, being black and brown, being politically disenfranchised. If we're in Gross Point, Michigan, that doesn't happen. Do you think that politically disenfranchised is actually kind of the number one part of that and what happened in Flint. It's like poor and black, yes. Politically disenfranchised, you can immediately hear the governor, was it the governor or the mayor, yeah. excuse me? Like saying like, well, they don't vote. Right. No, this area doesn't vote. Like I, I don't necessarily have to worry about that, which is consistently great the, the problem with poor areas in this, in this country. And I'm not saying uh, this isn't any kind of like, you know, if you're poor, you should go out and vote. I'm not lecturing anybody at all. But historically speaking, uh, poor neighborhoods, because they feel disenfranchised, aren't, don't, aren't as big of a part as the election in terms of donating Very and voting. True. So you have politicians who are solely trying to support their candidacy and their jobs, right. and they're not actually working for the poor. I mean, working for the poor as a politician in this country is essentially- Bad for business. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's not just bad for business, but it's just speaking. Every, yeah. every politician says, I'm gonna work for the poor, I'm gonna work for you, but yeah. none of them are actually gonna do that, right. ever. I, it doesn't benefit them. I, I would push back a little bit and say, in today's political climate, people say they're gonna work for the middle class. Which doesn't even exist. Right. So like, yeah. So that's what I mean. It becomes this Who are you talking thing. about? Nobody. Yeah. See? See what I did there? So. And the book is out tomorrow. <laughs> but so, so it's fascinating, right? I don't think political disenfranchisement is the, is, the, is the key to this. I think that is a symptom of the problem of a system that defends class at all costs. I think as long as you have unchecked capitalism, you are able to have this type of mass poverty, right? You're able to have this type of mass disenfranchisement, and you create the context for white supremacy and other forms of anti-black racism to prevail, among other things. So this becomes the problem of Flint, but it also becomes a broader problem of the crisis of capitalism, because part of what happens in Michigan is that the, the, the emergency manager is not accountable to anybody because he's not a politician. Once the state fails, once it becomes a, a failed state of sorts, because it's financially insolvent, they get an emergency manager. The emergency manager replaces the person who would be like the governor, or the alderman, the, the, the governor, I mean the mayor, whatever. So what you have is somebody who's there to fix the problem, but they don't have to be accountable to the public because they are not public servants. 
So they're going to do what's efficient. The problem is that what's efficient in terms of, uh, of market logic isn't what's best for the people. The most efficient way to save money isn't, isn't to keep everybody's job. The most efficient way to save a town is to find the cheapest water possible. And when Detroit didn't play ball with them in the way they wanted, they went somewhere else and they went somewhere where there was lead in the water. And then when they found out, they didn't investigate it further. Why? Because it's cheaper not to. And because these people are disposable, to your point, it's, and, and there's no political uh, uh, infrastructure surrounding them to account for it or, or to punish them when they do fail the poor, nothing happens. You know? And it's not black, white, purely because you go to Baltimore and everybody's black, right? Mosley, Mos, Mosby is black, right? The mayor is black. Many of the cops are black. And many of them are suffering from the same problem. Freddie Gray had lead. Freddie Gray had lead. He, he was getting lead checks. So Freddie Gray in Baltimore was getting lead. And the cop, who, one of the cops who contributed to his death, also was getting lead checks. They grew up around the corner from each other. So everybody's in the same mess. So the problem is, at the core, I believe, is a system that defends class at all costs. That doesn't mean that all of our problems are reducible to class. Some shit is just racist. Some shit is just anti-Semitic. Some shit is just sexist. And that precedes the current economic mode of production. But, but what it does mean is that it's, it is almost impossible to repair the damage that has been done by anti-Semitism, that has been done by anti-black racism, that has been done by anti-Arab racism, that has been done by patriarchy, until we end the existence of a state that defends class at all costs. And that's what we see in this book. Absolutely. I would reiterate, but I think you made enough sense. That was perfect. Thank you. Uh, let's open it up to questions from the audience. Hey, Mark. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, this discussion has been completely fascinating. So I'm very curious to know more about your background and your journey to get to um, where you're at right now, because ultimately that's my goal, to become a host one day. So I'd uh, like to pick your mind for a minute and um, probably just ask for advice as to what's the best route to go about that. About being a host. Don't... <laughs> become a doctor? Yeah, I was going to say, doctor? don't do what I did. Like, don't get a PhD. Like, that shit is like the heart. Like, I took the most inefficient route to TV ever. You know what I mean? Like, I could have been doing so much different stuff. Um... My journey to TV was, was unexpected. You know, I, I was, I'm an anthropologist by training. I was pursuing a PhD at, uh, at Penn. Um, and while I was doing that, I was writing a little bit. I was, a, I was actually doing album reviews. I was doing uh, music criticism, mostly hip hop stuff. Um, and when I finished my PhD, I decided that I wanted to write columns for people. And this was 06. So in 06, like, this is like when blogs first started taking off. I was like, the, People didn't really have blogs like that, and microblogging didn't exist. Like there was no Twitter, there was no, you know, that stuff didn't exist. Huff Post, I don't think even. No, uh, Huff Post didn't. Like, oh, no, not five oh seven. Yeah, Huff mm -hmm. Post didn't come until a few years later. So, so there just wasn't a space for this stuff, and I was black. You know, I don't know if I mentioned this because you know we don't see race, but don't see it. Don't see <laughs> he's like, like, nope. <laughs> so, um, so when they need, when people needed commentary from black people, they would go to me because they would Google. So, like it was the Duke rape case that actually got me on the map, sadly because they were looking for different takes on it. And mine came right to the top because there weren't that many people talking about it. So CNN said, hey, you wanna come on and talk about it? I was like, cool. And, um, and it was fine. I mean, I went on once or twice and I didn't set the world on fire. It's just TV, right, and you keep going. I, then I started doing a little bit more that summer survivor, started dividing teams up by race. And so they wanted somebody to come on and talk about it, right? And so suddenly I was like one of the people they would call for black stuff. And then uh, Bill O'Reilly called. He wanted me to talk about Paris Hilton. Uh, don't ask me why. It must have been a slow day or something. And, uh, and then the next time, he, I was a decent guest. Again, didn't set the world on fire. The next time, he and I got into a heated debate about uh, whether it was offensive to call Barack Obama articulate. And that moment, we went back and forth. I won that debate, I, I think. Um, Is that the debate where on the show they had also, didn't they like Chiron you something that was like? Oh, you know the drug dealer thing? Yeah. That came later. That was that was a few that was that was after our honeymoon period. Oh, okay. But but in, in 07, 08, we were talking about whether it's okay to call him articulate. So we had this whole conversation. The viewers liked it. Bill O'Reilly loved it. He loves to debate people who are smart. He always thinks he wins. That's the best part about Bill. So his ego isn't crushed because he can't imagine himself losing, right? In his mind, he wins every fight. So he wanted me back on because he loves the fight. So we kept going back and forth. And finally Bill said, No, no, actually it's not true. I said to Bill, hey, you guys should hire me. I'd like a job. And they're like, you want to work here? And I was like, if y'all paying, you know. <laughs> so they sent me a contract, no agent, nothing. They just sent me a contract, and TV started for me. That's how TV started for me. I was at Fox News for a few years, um, and I was winning my debates. They fired me. Roger Ailes fired me. How'd that work out for you, Roger? Hey, Roger. 
And then, um, did he personally fire you? No, I, appa appa apparently, if, I, if we had had more personal interaction, I might have kept the job. Who knew? But we, um, we, uh, I got fired, and then uh, randomly, um, Black Enterprise called me and they asked me to host this show, and I'd never hosted a, a, a show in my life, right? I had no idea what hosting was. And people think I had just learned how to be a good pundit. Hosting is really, really hard, and you know. When you watch a good host, you're like, oh, hosting, look, that job looks easy. And when somebody really sucks, you're like, yo, that job looks really hard, you know? And when you watched me at first, you were like, yo, that shit looks really hard, because I just didn't know what I was doing. But I hired a coach, I kept developing, and they were very patient with me. And so I spent two years really cutting my teeth on the job, learning how to be a host. Um, then HuffPost called in 2012. Uh, and so I was doing both jobs. And um, HuffPost is really the place, HuffPost Live, um, is really the place where I grew as a host, where I cut my teeth and where I was able to really figure this thing out. Um, I had five, four to five segments a day, um, every single day, live TV. I learned how to do live TV, so I wasn't scared of live TV. I got more comfortable on the prompter. I got more comfortable with different kinds of guests. I mean, I'm so grateful to Roy uh, Seekoff, uh, who saw, uh, and Joe San Lopez, who, who, who was uh, the executive producer at the time, who saw something in me that thought that we could do this, you know, and that I could be successful at it. And of course, Ariana Huffington. Um, I think I have to echo that, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the just, same just, for me. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, it, honestly though, I mean, they gave us the space to do what we wanted to do. Ariana was incredibly gracious and generous. Roy was incredibly gracious and generous. Um, and, and I'm grateful to them. But that's how I learned how to really host and develop. But I still had coaches, I still did things. And I did something called the apprenticeship of observation. I, I would, when I went on other people's shows, I watched what they did. I took notes. I, I, I asked them questions afterward. And Bill, honestly, my, my biggest coach was Bill O'Reilly. You know, Bill, I, I remember we went to the Yankees Red Sox game one day. And it's like, you were watching you Bill? Me and Bill O'Reilly, yeah. And I was like, you know, I'm thinking about hosting a show. You know, what do I do? And he was like, you know, hosting is really hard. He said, because you got you to gotta orchestrate everything that's going on. You got people in your ear. It takes a real genius to make it work. Of course, I'm incredibly talented, so I make it look easy, but it's not as easy as it looks. I mean, this is how he talks to me. It's like watching Archie Bunker and Lionel talk on the old Jeffersons. Like, it's like, with no irony, though. He's talking to me like this. And he's like, you know, I'm incredibly talented, so I make it look easy, but it's really hard, and you need to just do this, this. But he gave me concrete steps. Um, and I took them, and I watched how he's a master of this. And I would watch like how Brian Gumble was a master of this and Matt Lauer was a master of this and Keith Oberman is a master of this. And I just kept watching people and trying to figure it out. You know, in, in, in the old black tradition, they say you preach like somebody else until you preach like yourself. I was hosting like other people until I figured out who I was as a host and HuffPost is where that happened. Um, and um, it was incredibly, just incredibly rewarding. Now if I were giving advice, I would say don't do that. Don't pursue a PhD, don't become an anthropologist, don't get fired from jobs and you know stumble into a job. I think TV is different now. When I started, I sound so fucking so old, but excuse my language. But um, like they didn't have the, the blogs. They didn't have Facebook Lives. They didn't have, I mean, YouTube existed, but it wasn't what it is now. I think the best way to get into hosting now is to create your own content. You know, and I couldn't do that. Just like people before me couldn't find a place like this, right? They had to go in Little Market in Spokane or you know Des Moines or, or, or Allentown, PA, and, and work the markets up as a, you know, in, in the traditional news route. You know, that's what Bill O'Reilly did until he found Current Affair and et cetera, et cetera, or Inside Edition. And you get what I'm saying? We don't have to do that anymore. Create your own content. Make your own blog spot radio show. Make your own TV stuff. You do your own streams. Get your own guests, and then develop there. I would tell everybody to get a coach. Everybody, Jordan had a coach, right? Like, every, if you're going to do this well, get a coach, or at least get a lot of feedback. Somebody who's not afraid, who won't just tell you, oh, that was good. Somebody who'll say, adjust your body this way. Don't talk so fast. Don't do this with your hands. You know, let your guests talk more. Position the camera. The other thing, I'll, finally, because I know we got to go, uh, I want to get, I guess we have time for another question, is learn every aspect of the job. One of the great things that benefited me is that I have learned, usually out of circumstance, you know, we, I, had, I had a crew of two when I was at Black Enterprise, and, and we, didn't, we were not in studio after the first season. So I learned how to do my own field producing. I learned how to set up my own shots. I learned how to, you know, I learned how to work uh, control rooms. You know, I don't always want to do this stuff. I learned how to write copy and scripts. That's why here I never bothered to do it because I already knew how to do. I already knew how to do it. You know, but like, you know, you, but you, you should know how to do every aspect of the job or as many aspects of the job as possible because it makes you a better host when you have a producer's eye and ear. Um, it makes you a better. Um, host when you kind of have sense of aesthetic sensibilities, when you know what the shot's supposed to look like, and when you know what producers are trying to get out of you in a, in a certain segment when you're interviewing people. I think all that stuff matters. Yeah, I think the best host is a producer first, in, in, Absolutely. in my opinion. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I just wanted to know, how is it to be a political correspondent in 
one of the most politically sensitive times in our nation. <laughs> it's incredibly gratifying. It's incredibly gratifying. Um, I get every day to intervene in a public conversation. And as somebody on the left, what I consider to be the real left, I feel like I'm intervening in a conversation that, we, uh, that would otherwise be different, right? So if I'm not there, the person they put in my place may not say what I'm gonna say about mass incarceration or about the free market or about the occupation of Palestine, right? And so I, or, or about free trade versus fair trade or about rape culture, or, you know. I like having the opportunity to talk about those things. I like being able to intervene in those conversations. These are the good old days. There's gonna come a moment 20 or 30 years from now when we're gonna talk about what this moment was. We went from a black president to maybe Donald Trump. We go from a black president to the first woman president. Incredible moment. The era of WikiLeaks. The era of reality TV meshing with politics. The era of state violence. August 9, 2014 started a movement, the longest resistance movement to state violence that we've seen in American history, and it's still going. Campus is being turned upside down all around the country. We got people dying in the streets. We got police, we had five police officers die in Dallas, right? We got police officers dying in Baton Rouge. We have a conversation about state violence, and then we have mass killings of police officers. We have lead in the water, we have people dying. We got the damn Russian intelligence agencies involving themselves in infiltrating our stuff in the national election, again, between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. This moment is extraordinary. This moment is fecund. It's, it's filled with fertile possibility. This, this moment is so rich. And to be out here being able to report on it for BET News, being able to commentate on it for CNN, being able to write books on it, nobody, being able to be on VH1 Live to, to mock the pop culture dimensions of it, man, I couldn't be more great. If I lived to be a thousand, I couldn't be, I couldn't thank the gonna, world enough to, for this being possible. Absolutely. I'm going to follow up with just a kind of a, a negative question. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it is an incredible moment, and we were talking about it in the green room. Just this summer is the mo one of the most, like, is going to go down in history. It's just yeah. like an incredible summer. A rough one, but uh, <laughs> yes. a an incredible one. And I'm curious, you know, Sure, a movement has st started in 2014, and we're still going, but to me, it felt like a movement started, I mean, I was a little too young, in 1991 with Rodney King, and there were riots, and there was lots of conversations happening around race and changing things. Yeah. And then the status quo just sort of realigned. I would do you feel like, do you see any possibility of the status quo not just sort of warming over yeah. the country once again? <laughs> Um, I'm a prisoner of hope, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm committed to the belief that the world can and will be better. Not optimism. I'm not saying everything's just going to be all right. But I'm saying the work we do in this world can make it such. I would disagree with the premise of the question. I don't believe 1991 is anything close to this moment. We saw resistance and rebellion after Rodney King, but we did not see the emergence of organized movements like Black Lives Matter. We didn't see the organized movements like Lost Voices or, or Dream Defenders or BYP 100. We haven't seen a national conversation about words like white privilege, state violence, body cameras. Because everybody says, you know, all these movements, all they do is talk, nothing's happened. You can't run for mayor of a city and not talk about who your police commission is going to be, what your stance is on stop and frisk, what you think about body cameras. It, it just doesn't exist anymore. The, the national conversation has changed, right, in a way that didn't happen in 91. I think the more comparable example is August 28th, 1955, when Emmett, Emmett Till is killed. And when his body is seen across America, when his face, which head, which is five times the normal size because they killed him, boy from Chicago killed in Mississippi, when you see that, when Mammy Till shows that, her, has an open casket funeral so that America can see the trauma of white supremacy and racism and lynching, again, what do we see? We go from August 28th, 1955 to August 28th, 1963, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which leads to what? 1964, public accommodations, 1965, Civil Rights Act. So we saw a social movement emerge from that moment of crisis, that generation saying we've had enough. I'm saying that this is another moment where this generation, a generation, has said we have had enough. Occupy is, is kind of the prototype for that, right? Then we see Black Lives Matter. Then we have, uh, we, we see the most, uh, expressed critique of, of Palestinian occupation in American history right now. We see the most profound critique of police, of state violence in American history right now. Never have the police been lower rated, right, in terms of, or let me put that differently. Never has there been more skepticism around police action than now, right? 
coincidentally, never has there been more surveillance of police action than now. So the, the tide is changing. Um, but you're right, there's always the possibility that our resistance get, gets co-opted. That's what happened in 64 and 65, right? That generation of people who resisted, suddenly their kids are not going to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and life is good. And now there's some of the people saying, why don't you Negroes behave better? Yeah. Mike Brown shouldn't be stealing cigarillos anyway. I get that. This is not a perfect movement and there's no problem-free solution. But this moment, I do think, is different than 91. I think it's much more like the 60s. And I think it's much more in tune with what we want. The discourse has changed. The leadership has changed. The agenda has changed. We're talking about, tr we, we are fighting for trans rights in bathrooms. Could you imagine that even five years ago, 10 years ago? I mean, this is an extraordinary moment. And I'm not gonna let Ricky, no, I'm <laughs> you're not gonna bring me down, Ricky. It's not true, it's boring. It's a boring movement, it's, it's a boring time movement. Nothing's happening. <laughs> exactly, but no, everybody, I, 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 straight white guy's bored, I don't get it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Too easy. All right, everybody, thank See, you so Mark, much. Mark, we talked Yo. about that. That was an accident. We were drunk. Sorry. No. <laughs> uh, VH1 Live, Sunday nights at 10 p.m. Yes. And nobody is out on shelves tomorrow, right? Yes. Order it today. Go on Amazon and every place else. Amazon, the casualties. Amazon. Uh, nobody. Casualties of America's World on the Vulnerable from Ferguson to Flint and beyond. Order it. Order some for your friends. We want this book to go to the top of the list, not just because I get a big check if that happens, but because we want the national discourse to be different, and I think this book helps do that. And he gets a big check if that happens. Yes. Mark, thank you so much for coming.